What's up, my wizards? It's Deb from SBMTG down there on the YouTube.com as usual. And today I've got a top 10 list for you. Not a deck tech, I know, but I also enjoy doing lists and such. And today's going to be a pretty fun one. I always enjoy doing this list whenever a set rotates. This is the top 10 cards that could have been contenders. The top 10 cards that everyone talked about but nobody actually played. The top 10 hyped cards, overhyped, uh, one would say. Real quick, before we start, hold up. Just want to asterisk right here because I want to clarify what I mean by the title of this video because a lot of these cards are fan favorites and there's going to be people in the comments like yo I've played this deck for like a year at FNM and it's been really fun it's won me some packs and it's competitive you know so I just want to clarify that I'm talking about the meta at large the standard meta that's established by you know bigger name events and mid-level events even like Star City Opens you know Grand Prix um, Invitationals Pro Tour Qualifiers the Pro Tour itself you know sort of the larger meta established by bigger name events I just want to start off with an honorable mention because honorable mentions are fun they allow you to talk about more cards this is disciple of the ring a fan favorite if there ever was one people still talk to me all the time about this card people really like this thing um and it's definitely something that never quite made it although it looked really appealing when it first came out but never was the control finisher people wanted it to be and we just got better control finishers in the format regardless so just was never what it really could have been, honestly. This card had some potential, and to anybody that played with Aetherling in the last format, this looked pretty good, but it just doesn't protect itself the same way. It doesn't deal guaranteed damage the same way. It's no Morphling, it's no Aetherling, but it did look pretty good at first, just never quite made it. Let's actually start the list though, number 10, as far as I'm concerned at least. This is a card that I was really excited about, I know a lot of people were too. It reads really well. This is Myth Realized right here. And there's like four enchantments on this list. It just You'd think that we'd learn by now that enchantments don't always work the way we want them to. Even though enchantments are hard to remove, which is something that this card had going for it. But as soon as you make it a creature, they blow it away. Hey Igby, by the way, you've been up here for a second, I just haven't acknowledged you, I'm sorry about that. But Myth Realized, you know, it just look at it. It's one mana, low cost, you know. It's going to be good in a deck that plays a lot of spells, like a control deck. Seems like a decent finisher because it's an early investment that you eventually make really big and just swing in for the win after you've controlled the board, right? Doesn't apparently work that way. It just this card got removed nearly every time I ever made it a creature, you know. And there are times where it'll win the game for you, but they're few and far between. And just like Disciple of the Ring, there are far better control finishers in the format. And this is an awful, awful top deck too. So just never quite was what people thought it might be, myself included. It's time for number nine. What if I told you that you could have a four mana 8-8 eight, eight that allows you to recast a dig through time for free? You'd be in. I imagine you'd be in. We all were. But Living Lore, number nine, just never quite worked out, you know? And a lot of people brewed this deck up. A lot of people that write articles for places like Star City, Channel Fireball, TCG Player, a lot of people brewed this deck up, but it just didn't do the thing. You know? The entire deck hinges on one very transparent and easy to see coming trick. So it just, again, did not happen, you know? And a deck that plays all these spells just tries to shoehorn in living lore and play this stupid thing on the fourth turn and it just doesn't work. It gets removed or they, you know, they just jump block it because it has to get through for combat damage and that sucks, you know? So just so many ways of stopping the card and it's just completely inconsistent and it looked really nice. Really, really nice. Like a fun brew around thing. Let's make this happen. But it just never did. Number eight is a legendary sword, and usually those are pretty good in whatever format you're trying to play them in at the, at the time. But Sword of the Animus just turned out to be the least impactful legendary sword probably of all time. Can we say that? A lot of people, myself included, were got by this card when it was first spoiled. We were like, oh, it can thin the deck, it can fix your mana, you know, it can sort of ramp you. So a lot of good things about the card, but spikes are just kind of down on equipment unless those equipments are in like very specific modern decks. <laughs> you know, ramp decks didn't play this thing because they don't care about getting early creatures through for combat damage. They'd rather play things like Nissa's Pilgrimage, Explosive Vegetation, you know. Um, and there's also that a lot of these green decks um, will just play Nissa and she allows you to go search up forests. So there was just way better stuff that did similar things without having to have some sort of claws, you know. In this case, you have to have a creature to make this thing work and you have to invest some mana into it. And it's just overall kind of a mess. Number seven is a personal favorite and a card that I super pimped really hard when it first got spoiled. Like, this is it, you guys. This is a card, but it's just... It was never a card. I don't think I ever saw this in like any top eight list from any real event. This is Dragon Whisperer, and Big Red usually freaking loves 
two drops like this. Honestly, standard formats usually love two drops like this and will just bend over backwards to play something like it. Great Mana Sync has both early and late game implications, you know. Again, Swiss Army Knife Creature that does a ton of stuff, and in this case, it's also a bear, just a two mana two two with a bunch of stuff labeled on top of this. And it's cards like this, by the way, that didn't pan out that make people think like, oh, Grim Flayer sucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? We've seen two mana two twos that look really good in the past and didn't work out. So sometimes it can be hard to judge them. But something like this looked very, very good to me. But that sort of mid-range red strategy just never really happened in this last year or two, honestly. You know, any big mid-range strategy with red before, you know, I guess green-red monsters at the end of Pharaoh Standard, that was big, but it's not going to play Dragon Whisper. <laughs> it's not going to do that. we just got better things to do on turn two, which was the problem with this card the entire time it was in Standard. We've just got better stuff on turn to. So I wanted this card so badly to be real, but obviously never was. Wow, sorry about that. I was sort of unexpectedly passionate about Dragon Whisperer. That was a rant. Um, all apologies. But anyway, let's move on to number six. And warning, three enchantments in a row here. But they're all like super funky build arounds. Number six is Mirror Mockery, which is one of those cards that people in the comments are going to be like, dude, I have played Mirror Mockery for a year and it's cray. And like, I'm with you. Like, Mirror Mockery is really fun. It's a great build around and there's so crazy tricks in the format. You know, back in the day we had Siege Rhino and Ringmate, uh, Wingmate Rock in the sort of, you know, Abzan Splash Blue deck. Really good tricks with Mirror Mockery in that deck. We had Sadisi's Faithful, which was just hilarious and really budget um, if you wanted to play sort of the mono blue or blue black um, you know, Mirror Mockery deck. That was a great card, Sadisi's Faithful was. You know, you had Sadisi herself, which was a good card with this. There's just so many freaking tricks with Mirror Mockery in this format that you'd think that this card would have at least tried to be a thing, but Honestly, people just, you know, spikes, again, pro players and people that go to these big events just don't like enchantments, especially these creature R's, because you get two for one done. If they remove the creature, you also lose your aura, which means that you spent two cards, they only spent one. That is one of the serious taboos of professional magic, and there's reason for that, definitely. Getting two for one sucks hard. So, Mirror Mockery, it makes sense why it was never a thing. But budget players out there and people that just, you know, go to F&M at certain card shops, you know, just card shops that have a sort of lower pool, you know, in there. And I like those card shops, don't get me wrong. But card shops that not everybody plays, you know, net decks or like the biggest decks in the format. Cards, you know, card shops like that, people really, really love this card. <laughs> so, you know, Mirror Mockery is all the fun to play with, but just didn't have the depth to be a pro-level card. Number five was going to be Erebos' Titan, but I realized Erebos' Titan actually did see kind of a lot of play when Theros Block was still in the format. You know, it curves into Great Merchant of Asphodel and those Black Devotion decks. So it did see a lot of two and three of play for like six months, and it just can't make the list with six months of two and three of play in one of the best decks in the format. So no Erebos' Titan. So number four, or number five, is going to be... <laughs> assault Formation. Ready for it? Assault Formation. This is another card that people are going to be like, this is one of the most fun cards ever, and it totally wins me f and I know it does. I brewed this card up, like, twice. It actually is always kind of surprisingly good, but just doesn't have the legs for the faster pacing and sort of, you know, value-driven standard format. So, you know, Assault Formation just never quite had the legs to be real, but it is one of those cards that everybody loves sort of the world over and that everyone acknowledges that you can build a workable deck with and there were a surprising amount of you know viable assault formation strategies whether it was green black blue green there was a green white deck too you know that plays the stupid wall that gets you a you know three three um awakens one of your lands when it comes in so there were a lot of real strategies with assault formation a lot of three color and four color assault formation decks that people popped up with at FNMs, but never really, to my knowledge, saw an Assault Formation list at a real event. And that's sad, because the card really is awesome. Number four is my personal favorite card on the list. This is Starfield of Nyx right here, and I freaking love cards like this, you know. And this thing looks nice, you know. It has synergy with itself. That's awesome. Allows you to bring enchantments back in, and we have enchantments in the format that have, like, enter the battlefield triggers, so that's really, really cool. Makes all your big enchantments that aren't auras into huge creatures, you know. So, I really like this thing. I like it with Sigil of the Empty Throne, you know. There's just a lot of implications for this card for the last two years. We have Herald of the Pantheon in the format, 
too. We have Helm of the Gods. There's just so many options. I even love the name. Starfield of Nyx. The art is amazing. Everything about this card is great. But I would very, very sparingly see Starfield lists in top eights. The whole last couple of, or really last year, I've probably seen maybe four or five Starfield of Nyx lists in total in top eights, and that's just not quite enough to be a real force in the format at all. And a lot of people talked about it. But it just was never a thing. By the way, we've already gotten to the point in the season where I'm not using um, cards from Origins or Dragons anymore. But if you want to see the quickest deck tech of all time, here it is. Starfield of Nyx, Sigil of the Empty Throne, Stasis Snare, Silk Wrap, Pacifism, Quarantine Filled, Lunar Force, and Prison in the Moon. Done. And you could probably play Oath of Jace in the deck. That seems like a pretty good pick. But anyway, Starfield of Nyx is just a, it's an old friend of mine, and I'm very sad to see it go. Again, my favorite card on this list by a lot. I really like stuff like this, and we'll probably never see it printed again, which is super sad. Now we're into the top three. My number three is Chandra Fire of Kaladesh. A lot of people speculated on this, but as soon as we started playtesting with it, I think a lot of us universally realized that it's just not as good as we wanted it to be. And what's sad is that there is a card that is very, very close to this at common that is exploding in popularity right now. But the funniest thing is that Thermo Alchemist is probably an objectively better card than Chandra, and that's a little embarrassing. So Chandra, you could have been only slightly better. I just feel like they don't they didn't want this card to be like broken. Good news is they pulled it off. Let's go to number two. And numbers two and one are both planeswalkers. So take your pick real quick. Number two Drum roll, while you're still thinking of what your pick's going to be. Number two is Sarkin Unbroken. Sarkin Unbroken, this look, look at this freaking card, you know? Sarkin Unbroken makes big, stupid dragon flyers that can just win you the game. It's always good when a, when a planeswalker can just win you the game. That's nice. He also draws your cards and fixes your mana at the same time. That's crazy, and his ultimate isn't great or anything, but he can pull like a Tarka out of your deck and just put his stupid fat body on the battlefield. That's good. Same thing with, you know, other dragons that you might happen to be playing. But Teemer was just never a thing, even though its, its fan base was devoted. Teemer fans are like the happiest and most devoted to their clan people of, of all of the Khans clans. So, like, people really, really rooted for Teemer. And it just never, it never did happen. And that sucks, because Sarkin and Broken is a really, really fantastic card. I promise you, he just never found a home. We've arrived at number one. She's also a Planeswalker, as I've said. And you could say the same thing about her as you could say about Sarkin and Broken. Never found a home. And that's super sad. Number one is Narset Transcendent. One of the most freaked out about cards of the last year or so here. You know, just Narset, a lot of people were rooting for her and wanted her to be real. A lot of old school control players are like, holy crap, blue white control's real again. Thank you. Thank you, Narset. But that just never really happened. It never was the case. And Esper Control was a real deck when this card first came out, but it just didn't have the time or the room to find any use for Narset for the last like four or five months while this card was in the format and Ashiok was in the format. That's when Esper Control was a really serious deck. Um, but with, with you know, the Theros rotation went Esper Control for a while. Eventually we got Esper Dragons. Problem is, that deck plays way too many creatures to be very good with Narset. And then we had another Esper Control deck in the format, but that deck plays too many Planeswalkers to be really conducive to Narset. They usually play one Narset, but those Esper Control decks were a thing for Pro Tour Shadows of Innistrad and almost nothing else. They just weren't a real dominant factor in the format. So, and her second ability is kind of awkward. You know, you want to play mostly spells in a control deck on your opponent's turn. And you can't do that with her second ability. Sure, you can rebound stuff on your turn. Spend mana on your turn. I don't want to do that. And you can't, like, rebound counter spells anyway, so that's kind of dumb. You know, her second ability is just kind of awkward. And the other problem with Narset is that she's a planeswalker that can't just straight up kill your opponent. She has no way of killing your opponent. Um, and people don't like that. <laughs> and I don't blame them. So Narset just looked really, really appealing, super flashy, and great built for blue-white control decks, but blue-white control was just never around. And it's always heartbreaking to see Planeswalkers on these lists, you know, but usually they're the top cards on the list because they're the most heavily speculated on. You know, seven months from now, you'll probably see Kiora in this slot. A year from now, you might see Tamiyo in this slot dislike button hit by a couple people there. But you might, you might see Tamiyo in the slot a year from now. Because it's always, again, really heartbreaking when planeswalkers don't live up to their potential. And in the case of Narset, especially because so many people were convinced that this was the real. That's it. 
I've probably missed a million cards that people really, really like and thought were really awesome. I'm sorry about that. But again, I got a sheet of paper with a million different cards written down on it. So I probably have at least some opinion on it. So let me know in the comments how you felt about not only the picks on this video, but the things that I missed. I'm always really interested to hear about that. I'm Dev from SBMTG. If you enjoyed the content, like the content, hit the thumbs up button, and subscribe if you're new. And I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching, my wizards.